<clears throat> well, well, well. Pretty much on fire there, choir. How are you doing? <clears throat> well, I'm back again for another service. Uh, I have a, an orthodontic appointment December 11th coming up, right? It's December 11th, right? It's coming up. And I have an, a doctor's appointment. What is it? Orthopedics. <laughs> what did I say? Oh, I've got those coming up too. <laughs> All right, orthopedics, pray for that, okay? My arm is still uh, killing me, so I'm going to do my best to go forward and, and uh, we'll just have a good time. Amen? Amen? The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turning the word of truth this morning to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Robert, if I could trouble you for another, coffee, uh, another tea, could you get it? Exodus chapter 20. Okay, again, this is going to take us a little bit longer than expected because of my unexpected problem. But anyway, in Exodus 20, verse 7, where our main passage is the third commandment, which is found in Exodus 27, which says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That is the key. For the Lord your God will not leave him unpunished. That means he'll be under discipline, the one who takes his name in vain. Now, if you were here last Sunday morning, I told you that when you take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, you will be under a curse until the Lord comes back. Nehemiah, I'm I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Paul said you're going to be anathema maranatha because not because you don't agape him, but because you don't phileo him. You don't love him personally. And so when he says, again, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, that means in a vain way, in a way of vanity, like Solomon tells us not to do. Because, and here's the result, if you do so, the Lord will not leave him and punish who takes the name in vain. So as I said this past week, I desire all of you never to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I have to give an answer for that if you're a member of my congregation. I have to give an answer to each one of you if you consider me your pastor teacher and you consider yourself to be a member of this local assembly. But never take the name of the Lord thy God in vain but to do so, you need to focus in on one major principle which is be who you are don't be a clone. I was watching Christian television this morning. I don't know. I figured my whole body's hurting. I might as well let my spirit hurt a little bit. So I watched Christian television. It's amazing all how the, the vanity that's on Christian television is just amazing. So when we talk about taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain, to do so, you need to focus. When you're not to do so, you need to focus it on one major principle, which is be who you are. I am what I am by what? The grace of God. Be who God made you to be. Don't try to copy like a lot of Christians are doing today, like in Christian programming. Be who you are. Live as an ambassador for Christ and don't live in vain. So with that in mind, Robert, thank you very much. You want to heal you, I want that healing. Is that what you said? No, you want to heal there. Oh, I thought you said you don't want a healing. <laughs> he said here or there. I'll take the healing. <laughs> All right, so with this in mind, now, what is the one major doctrine, I believe, the major doctrine that verse 3 brings up for the church age believer? Well, I believe the major doctrine is found in the subject called ambassadorship, the doctrine of ambassadorship. We noted some principles upon these, but I'm going to begin this morning with seven major principles on ambassadorship. First of all, turn in your Bibles now to the book of John, chapter 15. These are going to be seven important principles on the principle of ambassadorship. Now under point one, again, we deal with the definition and we deal with the description. What is an ambassador? Well, we have to go to the natural realm and then bring it over to the spiritual. The natural realm, the definition and description. An ambassador is a high-ranking minister of state or of royalty sent to another state to represent his sovereign or his country that he has come from. Again, let me repeat it. Definition and description. You are a royal priest. Amen? 
You're a royal ambassador, so you are royalty. So you are a high-ranking official. Now, being an ambassador, you're a high-ranking minister of a state. A state is called heaven in Philippians 3.20, and or of royalty. And you're sent to another state. You, as a member of the royal family, are sent to planet Earth. You're in the world, but not what? not of the world. So you represent his sovereign or country that you have come from. Your job and my job is to actually represent the nation or the country that God had, that we have come from. And of course, we are from above and the Pharisees were from below because once we are in union with Christ, we now are in union with the one who is in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen to that. So this brings us to our second point, and here's the seven important principles. An ambassador, let's, let's look at the profile of an ambassador, seven important principles. First of all, an ambassador does not appoint himself. You don't go around and say, I'm the ambassador to Portugal, I'm the ambassador to England or Ireland. No, you don't appoint yourself. An ambassador does not appoint himself. We are appointed by God himself at the moment that we believe in Jesus Christ. We were appointed by God. You did not choose him. He what? Chose you. He did know what decisions you would make, but he also chose you based upon those as well. And therefore, God gives you the power and the ability to handle the calling that he places upon you. All of you have been called. You are a member of the ek. Klesia. Ek means out from. Klesia means out from the world or for, uh, uh, calling. It means you have a calling that is out from the world. And so you have a calling on your life. And that's the day that you became a believer and you were appointed as an ambassador. But not only were you appointed, but then God said something else. You don't have the power and the ability to execute my plan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all the power and the ability to do so. The power is there. The ability is there. There's only one thing missing. What is it? Volition. Your free will. That determines whether or not you'll take advantage of your calling. Look at, again, John 15. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> Our Lord says this. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his who? For his friends. You are my friends. And notice who the Lord calls friends. If you do whatever I command you, if you do what I command you according to his word, you follow his doctrines, you are said to be uh, a friend. No longer do I call you slaves. Why? For the slave does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, notice, I have made known to you. Even the father is the only one. God, the Holy Spirit, God, I mean, the father is the only one who knows exactly when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back in his humanity. So notice what he says in verse 16 for the ambassadorship. You, an ambassador, you did not what? You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And not only that, I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. But not only that you should go and bear fruit because you've been appointed to do so, but your fruit should remain that whatever you ask of the Father, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love impersonally one another. So notice again, an ambassador does not appoint himself. Secondly, the ambassador does not support himself. You don't have to worry about that if you're a child of God. We have promise after promise in the word of God. The church age believer as an ambassador for Christ is provided for by what we call logistical grace. What is that? God says, I will provide for you everything that you need. Amen? Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and I'll add all things unto you. Amen? Logistical grace support. Matthew 6.33 is the most popular one. But if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all the things mentioned in verses 24 and on having to do with the worries of the world, all those things, the worries of the world, shall be added to you. You won't be worried about them because God will supply. A third important principle concerning the ambassadorship is the ambassador's instructions are always in, get this, Written form. Amen? Isn't that an amazing correlation, isn't it? It's in written form. The Word of God's fantastic. Even though I'm in a very uncomfortable position studying and trying to write, I'm still deriving pleasure and still deriving power from the Word of God that's alive and powerful. So 
And trust me, my body, I, can't, I cannot even focus in on what part of my body does not hurt. They are all it hurts, except I don't want to focus in on any of them because they'll hurt before I leave. I think, I hope, I hope not anyway, but thank you for your prayers. I really appreciate them. Let's get on. The, inspect the ambassador's instructions are always in what kind of form? <laughs> Written form, so that he has no doubt as to what you should, he should do. You should have no doubt. Do you know the problem-solving devices? Do you know the different forms of the, uh, the mystery doctrine of the church age? Do you know what it means to be an ambassador and a priesthood, and they were not that in the Old Testament? Do you know what it's like to be, uh, have a command that says, be filled with the Spirit, but you don't have that in the Old Testament? Walk by the Spirit, you don't have that? Do you know these things? Well, they're in written form. You should have no doubt as to what you should do. We have the policies, always grace, the problem-solving devices, they had eight in the Old Testament, we have two. They were minus two. Problem-solving device number two, the filling of the Spirit. Number ten, occupation with Christ, both of which Christ did not need. Therefore, we have the policies, the problem-solving devices, the instructions, the principles, the doctrines and concepts in what kind of form? Written form in the Scripture. Number four, turn now to Philippians chapter three. The fourth important principle, and I, I actually have about 18 of these, but I'm just going to give you the ones I think are vital for our st subject. But number four, the ambassador does not belong to the country to which he is sent. If you're an ambassador to Portugal from the United States, you don't belong to Portugal. You belong to the United States. I mean, yeah, if you, if you are sent to Portugal and you're sent from the United States, you represent the state that sent you. Same thing in the spiritual realm. The ambassador does not belong to the country to which he is sent. We don't belong to this world. We're in the world, but not of the world. Our citizenship and our home is said to be where? In heaven. We are also citizens, by the way. Not only should we be a great citizen of heaven, that's the most important citizenship, but we are also great when we recognize that we're also fantastic ambassadors and, and, and believer priests that can glorify God in a way that they could never glorify God in the Old Testament because they did not have the resources that we do. And yet some of God's people, probably some here this morning, sitting here like a bump on the log wondering what it's all about, missing out on God's highest and best. You know, I said to God the other day, how long is this going to go on, God? And he just says, shut up. You're going to be able to do something for me that you can never do when you die and go to heaven. You're going to be able to go through suffering and stop bitching. <laughs> I said, that wasn't me. That was my wife. I said, oh, that's right. I'm not married. So anyway, no, I'm teasing there. But listen, I, I got to have a little bit of heart. Laughter does good like a medicine. All right. Right now, my right arm is killing me. My left arm is killing me. My left toe is killing me. And my butt is killing me. But I'm still going strong. Amen. <laughs> listen, the just trying to have a fun because laughter does good like a medicine. Amen? Amen? By the way, don't forget, Christmas is coming up. And we're going to have our, what's, what's the uh, Christmas Eve service, Sam? It's the 24th. It's the 24th. What, is the, what day is that? It's a Sunday. So we're going to have, well, Sunday morning will be our service then, not Sunday night. Okay. Well, we'll not, not start coming up. Sorry. I haven't been around, so I, these are my staff meetings that I'm having. So listen, the ambassador does not belong to the country which he has is sent. We don't belong to this earth. Our citizenship and home is in heaven, and we are also citizens of a client nation of God. We should be great citizens of heaven, and, uh, and we should be great citizens of this nation. But more than that, the citizenship of heaven is our most important citizenship. Finally, Philippians 3.17, which talks about our home is in heaven, and we are also citizens of the client nation to God. Paul says this, Brethren, join in following my example. And observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Notice that there's a pattern to walk in. People say, that sounds like legalism. It's not legalism. God says, I'm laying before you a plan. We call it the pre-designed plan of God here at Grace Bible Church. Some people call it the plan of God. Some people call it the protocol plan. Call it what you want, as long as you know what you're referring to. But we have a plan, a fantastic plan, to which we should re recognize there have been individuals who have gone before us who have become examples for us to follow. 
They're called spiritual fathers. I'm a spiritual father to many men throughout this nation. And uh, you have a lot of people that are spiritual fathers. They're like the individuals who train those who are being trained, like I did with Pastor Rick Bettis and Rick Kabrick and other individuals that have been ordained. Whether it worked out or not, it's not my problem. That's between them and the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, we've got something fantastic, and we have individuals that we can learn from. So Paul says, brethren, join in following my example and observe. He doesn't say copy, does he? He says, observe those who walk according to the pattern you have seen in us. The pattern was the plan of God for the church age. For many walk, of whom I've often told you, and now I tell you even weeping, that they are walking and they are what? The enemies of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says. Many walk of whom I have told you many times, and I'm telling you now even weeping. He literally wept for these people. That's how much he loved his congregation. I've gone through that in the past couple of years like never before, thinking of certain people that are lost and thrown away, and, and uh, we've reached out to some and they don't respond, and it's hurtful. And I hate, the one excuse I hate is like, well, I don't like to go back because I feel everybody's going to judge me. This is the last place you're going to get judged if you go away. We don't even know you're missing half the time. That's your arrogance to think we missed you. We didn't even know you were gone. So, <laughs> that's good. Listen, many walk, of whom I've often told you, and now I tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the what of Christ? The cross of Christ. What did the cross deal with? Sin, Right? They're the enemies of what the cross dealt with, sin. The cross dealt with sin. They're not going to deal with sin according to what the cross did. The cross was God saying, your sins and your iniquities, I remember how many times. No more. But those who are the enemies of the cross, listen to me now. They pick up their memory center on a day-by-day -day basis, and they go inside of it, and they will remember your sins and your iniquities better than you can. And they'll have it chap they'll have it documented in their little legalistic, religious, self-righteous prig of a book as they invite their local Pharisees to their so-called love feasts, which are nothing more than hypocrisy in action. Wimpy, simp skimpy, mindless, gutless, jellyfish individuals who have no idea what the truth is all about. Amen. Amen. I got that off. Now let's get back to my humility. Look at many walk of whom I have often told you, I now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end, now notice, is what? Destruction. Remember what I told you? I told you in the beginning of this message, I said there's people that are going to fall away because of the fact that they don't personally love the Lord thy God with all their heart and soul. The anathema maranatha. Paul says their end is the sin unto death is destruction. Why? Their God is not their appetite. That word appetite means feelings or emotions. Whose glory, when they stand before God, the glory has to do with their resurrected glory. What will they have? They'll have only one form of glory, a resurrected body. That's it. No other forms of glory because they received no blessing because they never glorified God in time, executing the pre-designed plan of God for their life. Our citizenship is where? In heaven. So the Bible, let the, the, the people that don't follow this, they, their end is destruction. Their God is their emotion. They glory. Their glory is nothing more but in their what? In their what in verse 19? Shame. That means they're embarrassed. I don't know about you, but do you want that to be a eulogy about you? Here stands Joe Johnson, a loser. A loser believer. Joe accomplished absolutely nothing in life. He couldn't even get anybody to marry him. Not even of the same sex, Joe didn't have any help. Now, poor Joe. No, it's going to be embarrassing, but that won't be the issue. The issue is, what did you do with the resources God gave you? What did you do with the filling of the Spirit? What did you do as an ambassador? What did you do as a royal priest? Our citizenship, he says, is in where? Where is it, ladies and gentlemen? It's in heaven. From which heaven, we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state. That's our body that we're living in now. And thank God he's going to transform it, amen, into, into the body of our humble state and into 
conformity with the body of his glory. In other words, we're going to have a resurrected body like he did, except there's going to be no, sor no, no, no scars. There's going to be no wounds. It's going to be totally perfect. The only body in heaven that has scars and wounds, of course, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. And he'll do this by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Do you see what that says? He says he's got the power to take this earthly body right now and transform it. Why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't he heal right away? Why doesn't he solve all our problems? He wants us to recognize that though the old man is perishing, the new man is being renewed day by day. He's, met, he's telling us that we can live a life right now that brings glory to him, and it's undeserved suffering. And it's a suffering that we can thank God we've had the privilege and the opportunity to go through. Yes, we don't like it. Yes, there's pain, there's sorrow, there's heartache, there's difficulty, there's friends that we love and people that we see uh, on, the way, on the way to going to the plan of God or going with the plan of God who fall away. We know that. You can't do anything about it because you can't violate their free will. But one thing we do know, I can work out my own salvation and you can work out yours. And we can become ambassadors that truly do bring glory to Christ. The fifth principle, number five, the ambassador does not live in the foreign country for his own personal interest. What are you here for? Why are you here? What are you here for? To glorify God. Now, if you're going to glorify God, you're not going to live for this country. You're not going to say, well, I've got two homes. I think I need three. I got four cars, I need another one. I need more TVs, more this, more that. I need stuff, 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 more stuff. No. The ambassador does not live in the foreign country for his own personal interest. We live here on earth solely to serve in the interest of who? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And therefore, number six, the ambassador. And this is a very important one because this is where you pick up your shield of faith. This is where you walk by means of the Holy Spirit. This is where you apply the problem-solving devices like impersonal, unconditional love. And I love you because of who and what I am, not who and what you are. What is it? The ambassador doesn't treat any insult to himself as personal or most important. Jesus Christ actually said that, didn't he? Didn't he say, don't get shocked if the world hates you? They hated me. They're going to hate you. And he says, don't get shocked. The servant's not greater than his master. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. So the ambassador is smart. He doesn't lower himself or herself down to the standards of others. The ambassador does not treat any insult to himself as personal or most important. This is the royal ambassador's function in his spiritual self-esteem. He's content with who and what he is and in personal love for all mankind. Did you get that? Let me go back. If you have spiritual self-esteem, you have confidence with your relationship with God. Amen? Amen? You also have unconditional, impersonal love for all mankind. So, when you're insulted, you don't take it personal. You actually pity some of these people that they are that dumb that they can't see the nature of God in all things. I think the greatest thing that's ever happened in TV land is the nature stations. Because when you see the way the animal kingdom functions, and the, and the birds, and the bees, and, and the bugs, and it's amazing to say there's no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so when we see these things, we just say, wow, what a privilege it is that I am a part of the individual's life. I'm a part of the family of the one who created these fantastic things that I'm seeing that nature is revealing. Because in Psalm 19, even the stars as today, the moon, and I guess it was 1040 or 1050. No, oh, it's almost here. The, the, even the stars uh, declare the glory of God. The stars, uh, the stars declare the glory of God. The moon, the sun, nature itself. And yet we miss out. Why? Too busy, too occupied. So the ambassador doesn't treat any insult to himself as personal or most important. Someone says, I don't believe in that nonsense. Well, don't. Believe what you want to believe. Believe that you came from monkeys. <laughs> or a big bang, okay? 
No, if you have spiritual self-esteem, you're confident with your relationship with God. If you have impersonal love for all mankind, you're confident with your relationship with others as well. And that includes yourself, giving yourself confidence. We tolerate others, we tolerate them, but we hold no grudges. When we are insulted, we're treated unfairly or ridiculed, ridiculed we have tremendous problem solving devices. And therefore, number seven, the seventh one, and I guess this is going to be the last one I give you this morning. This will conclude our second point and set us up. I won't be here Wednesday or Friday. I will be here next Sunday, and hopefully after I see what's going on with the doctor, uh, the orthopedics, I'll hopefully be on par at, right after the 11th. So keep me in prayer with that, okay? Did that sound come out right? Yes. Okay, date. Okay, number seven. When an ambassador's recall, this is fantastic. His recall, whenever you know a country's going to war, you know why? One of the first things they do, they did this with Osama bin Laden and his family. The Bush family did this. They got the whole bin Laden family out of the country. Because when ambassadors are recalled, it's tantamount to a declaration of war. That's analogous to the rapture of the church. The tribulation period is going to come. That's analogous to the period of war. When the tribulation period comes right before that happens, God takes out the people, the ambassadors. He takes out all of his people. He says, I'm going to, Revelation 3.10, I'm going to take you out of the hour that's about to try the entire world. That's another subject. It's not our subject, but it's a great principle or an analogy because the ambassador represents the church. If those who are alive at that time when the rapture comes, they will be taken out of this earth and not go through suffering. Our Lord would never do that to his bride. Well, we'll continue with our third point where we deal with point three, the royal ambassadorship and specialized as a specialized and intensified gift found in the past the teacher and what you need to look for and how these things apply to your life. So with that in mind, I'd like to